Hi, my name is Daniel Baxter from the University of Chicago. I'd like to thank the organizers for having me today. I'm very happy to be representing the Domicate Snow Lab collaboration to present latest results uh, from the full exposure of the Domicate Snow Lab detector. Uh, so to start, many of you have probably heard of dark matter. This is one of the biggest problems, uh, I would say, in physics today. Uh, but essentially, evidence for dark matter goes back as far as galaxy rotation curves or as recent as uh, the CMB, where measurements of the CMB have uh, given strong evidence, in particular, for cold dark matter. So from this, we can say a, a couple things about dark matter if it is a new type of particle. For one, we know that it should interact gravitationally, and if it, it, it shouldn't interact, interact through the electromagnetic force, uh, at least not particularly strongly, hence the term dark, or we would observe it with our telescopes. Uh, but as far as whether it has to have some other type of interaction, it might. And if it does, we could look for that. And so there are two main particles that people propose. One is weakly interacting massive particles, or WIMPs, and the other is axions. Uh, and there are many, many other models that I don't have time to list here, but I would say these are the two leading candidates. I'm not going to have time today to talk to you about axions, so instead I'm going to focus on WIMPs. Now, when I talk about um, dark matter, I'm specifically going to be talking from the subfield of direct detection. And before I define that, I want to define what it isn't. So you've probably heard of dark matter searches, for example, at the LHC, where at a collider, they slam two standard model particles at very high energy into each other and try to produce dark matter particles. Uh, alternatively, at this conference, you'll probably be hearing a lot about indirect detection of dark matter. Now, when we talk about indirect detection, uh, that's going to mean looking for dark matter that is either annihilating into standard model particles or decaying into standard model particles. Uh, what I'm going to be talking about is different from both of those. I'm going to be talking about direct detection, wherein we build a detector to identify the small energy deposition of dark matter scattering off of standard model particles. And so this can happen essentially in two ways. You can have scattering off of nuclei, in which case you're thinking of the standard WIMP paradigm usually. And what this means is dark matter masses on the order of 1 to 1,000 GeV. Alternatively, you can have scattering off of the electrons in your detector, um, as in the case of models mediated by a dark photon. And this is going to involve masses uh, about an order of, or about three orders of magnitude lower, between about 1 and 1,000 MeV. Now for today, I'm not going to have any time to talk about dark matter scattering off of electrons, so I'm going to focus exclusively on dark matter nuclear scattering. Before I go any further, I do want to acknowledge the rest of the DAMA collaboration. This is an international collaboration that has put an enormous amount of work in over the last many years to produce the results that I'm presenting to you today. And the DAMA collaboration uses charge-coupled devices, or CCDs, to search for dark matter. Now, what a charge-coupled device is, it is essentially a, a block of instrumented silicon. Uh, what happens is an interaction in the silicon will produce free charge carriers, electrons and holes. We can then drift these across the silicon bulk using an electric field uh, with very little loss of charge and collect them in 15 micron squared pixels. Uh, this 15 micron size of our pixels gives us exceptional position resolution. And then we can transfer the charges we've collected across the pixel array into our readout node. And, and we can store them uh, in the pixels for a predefined uh, readout time of uh, many, many hours. And so this gives us the large exposures needed for a dark matter search. I'll just mention one more thing here, which is that the method of readout can be optimized to improve readout noise at the cost of position resolution. So in the data I'm presenting today, I will be talking about what we refer to as one by 100 binning. What this means is essentially that we have downsampled one position dimension by a factor of 100, which causes us to lose position resolution in that dimension at a, at, at a gain in noise. And this allows us to reduce our threshold compared to previous results. Now, as charges drift across the CCD, they experience lateral thermal motion or diffusion. Um, which is going to be proportional to the vertical distance traveled, or the depth of an event in the detector. 
And so I'm going to talk about that a little more on the next slide, but basically we reconstruct this diffusion in a parameter that we refer to as sigma. Now sigma is actually just the Gaussian width of a reconstructed event on our pixel array. And so it has units of pixels. This is going to be very useful for low energy events in determining their depth in the detector, but it is also useful for higher energy events above a KEV uh, because the event profile on the detector array can identify the progenitor. And this is basically a consequence of our exceptional position resolution. So for example, if you have a tight deposition, as in the, the lower left plot, uh, this is probably either a nuclear recoil or a low energy electron recoil. In the case of this one, it is a 4 keV beta. In the center plot, you see a slightly more elongated track. That means it is a higher energy electron recoil. Uh, in this case, a 41 keV beta, but you could also have a long track as from a muon. Now on the right here, you see a 4 MeV al alpha, uh, which is going to give you a very large blob in your detector. And one of the things that's very interesting about these three example events is that they all occur in the same position in the detector. And so we know with certainty that this is a beta beta alpha decay chain and not energy depositions as from dark matter. And so that's actually a very unique and useful tool that the CCDs can leverage uh, to reject intrinsic backgrounds. Now, when I talk about modeling diffusion, what I mean is taking our reconstructed sigma parameter and using it to map onto a true depth of an event in the detector. To do this, we need a calibration and for which we use muons. So muons give us an excellent calibration uh, for the depth dependence of sigma because they essentially travel in a straight path through the detector. So if, for an, as an example, we had a muon entering the front of the de detector here at z equals zero, you see that the lateral spread of the charges on the pixel array is very small. And as it travels through the CCD and leaves in the back, what you find is a much larger spread. And so you can use this straight path to directly calibrate diffusion as a function of depth. And this gives us a functional form that we can then fit to and apply to our data. Now we used all of this uh, in our 2016 results from a prototype uh, detector at Snow Lab, uh, the data of which is shown here in energy and reconstructed sigma. You will notice that we used uh, this sigma variable to do a fiducial cut, which allowed us to remove surface events at the back, which is high sigma, and front, which is low sigma of our detector. This allowed us to cut out uh, a low background region, a fiducial region to set dark matter limits. And with this, we actually set uh, some very competitive limits with only 0.6 kilogram days. Um, and I will just note that this prototype detector uh, used eight megapixel uh, or 2.9 gram silicon CCDs and took data during 2015. But it successfully demonstrated the ability of a low threshold CCD array to search for dark matter. Now, since then, uh, the prototype run, uh, uh, before I go further, I should say, the prototype run of Domic at Snow Lab never held more than nine grams of CCDs and had a fiducialized background rate of 15 counts per kilogram per day per KEV. Now, we often redefine this unit for, for simplicity as a DRU or differential rate unit, which I will refer to for the rest of the talk. The Domic at Snow Lab upgrade, which the results of which I'm presenting today, contains seven 16 megapixel or six gram active CCDs for a total mass of 42 grams and over 300 days of cumulative exposure with significantly lower backgrounds due to the addition of an ancient lead shield around the center of the detector. This gives a fiducialized background rate of about a factor of four lower than the prototype run. And additionally, one CCD which I will refer to as extension one or CCD one, held uh, the CCD inside of an electroformed copper module surrounded by ancient lead bricks, which gave that CCD a fiducialized background rate of approximately two DRU or almost an order of magnitude better than the prototype run. The data uh, from the result that I'll be presenting today was taken between September of 2017 and January of 2019 and you can see an image of the detector before it was lowered in the shielding on the right here, 
with CCD1 sandwiched between two lead bricks and the other CCDs below. This is what the CCDs themselves look like. They were designed by LBNL. They are 4,000 by 4,000 pixels or six by six centimeters squared with a pixel size of 15 by 15 microns and a thickness of 675 microns. They are cooled to approximately 140 Kelvin with one Kapton cable reading out each CCD. The dominant intrinsic background in these CCDs is expected to be tritium production from direct activation of the silicon wafers prior to production. Now, one thing that's very important to note is that in this 2016 result I was talking about, as I mentioned, we used a fiducial cut to isolate the bulk of the detector. However, with this new data, we want to push the threshold lower. And you can already note in this plot from the previous data that as you go to lower energies below a KEV, you get significant leakage of surface events into the bulk of your detector and signal. And so what this means is we're going to need a background model this time around in order to lower our threshold. So to build a background model, we're going to start by characterizing our backgrounds. So here, what I'm going to be referring to is electron recoil backgrounds, which is going to be gammas and betas. The assumption there is that neutrons, muons, and alphas uh, are going to be subdominant. We're going to simulate our detector, uh, in our case using JANT4 uh, with the Livermore physics list. We're going to choose an energy region of interest for our dark matter search. In our case, we will pick between 50 EV and 6 KEV where the lower bound of that range is where our reconstruction efficiency drops to 10%, and the upper bound is where we are mostly sensitive only to heavier dark matter greater than 10 GeV. We're going to set aside some amount of data as a check, in this case CCD1, since it has a very different background uh, environment, and we will perform a fit against data in order to construct a background model. And for this, we're going to choose the energy range of 6 to 20 keV, where we implicitly assume that there is no dark matter sensitivity in this energy range, since other experiments have excluded such dark matter models. The maximum bound of this range uh, is so that we can include the full tritium spectrum. This is what the detector geometry looks like in JANT4. Uh, and on the right, you can see a table of all decay isotopes that we simulate mainly coming from the uranium and thorium chains, lead 210, potassium, potassium 40, the activation of copper, silicon 32 in our CCDs, and tritium and sodium 22 from the activation of those CCDs. Each isotope is individually simulated um, for each detector volume with the energy and position of each energy, energy deposition recorded. We then apply our diffusion model to the, uh, with, to the energy depositions and pixelate them in terms of our 15 by 15 micron CCD readout. We then rebin these pixels according to our 1 by 100 down sampling and apply saturation and noise models. This gives us a set of templates that we can compare against data, but before we do that, we assay all components uh, of the detector near, near the CCDs such that we constrain the background levels uh, to, to the level at which each, each component is simulated to contribute one year. And the CCD activities, I'll just note in the plot above, are actually coming from a direct analysis of our data because this puts far stronger constraints on these activities uh, than the assays that we've been able to perform. And so that's a really interesting feature which demonstrates the power of this detector technology. And so this is the data in the energy range that we're gonna to want to fit to. This is between six and 20 keV, and you can see our reconstructed sigma variable on the y-axis. Uh, this is the result of the fit. Uh, I don't have time today to discuss our methodology very much, but I'll just show you uh, and I'll flip back and forth so that you can see we get very good agreement between the data and our best fit background model. I'll also note that we exclude the copper fluorescence line at 8 keV as we have been unable to model this in JL. If we project that best fit in energy, what we find is excellent agreement between the background model and the data, uh, where at low energies, we are dominated uh, by backgrounds from lead 210 on the CCD surfaces, 
with subdominant contributions from external backgrounds, mainly copper activation, and CCD bulk backgrounds, mainly tritium. Alternatively, we can project the background model onto the sigma axis. And what we find is that uh, we get good agreement with the, between the background model and data, both for the fit energy range of 6 to 20 keV and uh, the lower energy range of interest between 1 and 6 keV. And so this is the background model that we get once we do that. You'll notice we are mostly dominated by events in the back of the CCD at the high sigma region. And you can see how that uh, region pollutes down into lower sigma as you get down to lower energies, which is the reason we needed to develop this background model. And so this is the result when we compare that background model against data. In general, we find excellent agreement between the data and the background model, in particular uh, above 1 keV. But at low energies, we actually observe an excess of bulk events uh, near threshold. Now we choose not to report this bulk excess as a WIMP signal, mainly because we need better validation of the background model in this energy range, which I will talk about in a minute. But even in the presence of this excess, we're able to set excellent limits on dark matter using this detector. And in particular, I will point out that uh, our, our detector has reached its project projected sensitivity at the high mass range, which has allowed us to exclude uh, for the first time with silicon a substantial fraction of the CDMS2 allowed region. Uh, and at lower masses, uh, we are limited by this bulk excess. But the general takeaway here is that DOMIC phase one is complete. So DOMIC at Snow Lab was the first CCD dark matter array, uh, and we have improved the limits by a factor of about 10 and excluded a significant fraction of the CDMS2 silicon allowed region. Inevitably, we were going to have a few surprises along the way, um, and we learned a lot about how low background CCDs work. But the main thing I want to emphasize before I get to my next slides is that skipper CCDs are the future. And skipper CCDs are basically a new readout technique that allows us to achieve single electron resolution and thus essentially zero threshold data taken with a plot from Domic M shown here on the right. But we have this excess. And so the next steps in terms of this excess is to verify. Now to do that, we're going to take advantage of these skipper CCDs by installing them in the Domic at Snow Lab detector in place of our existing CCDs. This will allow us to take another measurement with the lower threshold in the same background environment which means that if this is a threshold effect, it should go away. And if it's a missing component in the background model, we will have many more events to study which can help us determine um, origin. On the right here, you see a contour plot of the preferred excess to the data from our global fit in terms of the exponential um, total number of signal events in the data on the x-axis and the exponential decay constant that we fit to that data on the y-axis. But looking to the future, Domic M. So the prototype Domic M low background chamber will test the background model I've presented here today using 25 grams of low background skipper CCDs that are shielded on all sides from two centimeters of ancient lead with an additional four centimeters of low background lead outside of that. This detector will achieve one DRU of background levels uh, with a two electron threshold and should get results next year. Beyond that, the Domic M detector, or Domic at Modan, will achieve a background-free exposure of one kilogram year above a threshold of two electrons using skipper CCDs. And you can see the projected sensitivity of the experiment on the plot to the right. In conclusion, I just want to emphasize that Domic at Snow Lab continues to produce new interesting results. For example, the nuclear recoil limits I presented here today which have been submitted to PRL and posted to the archive. I would also like to emphasize our electron recoil limits from last year, which you can also find on the archive. Domic M will improve on this with lower backgrounds, single electron resolution, and a much larger exposure, starting with the LBC next year, and then beyond with the full detector, which is set to be installed in 2023. 
Oscuro will push the limits of the CCD technology to 10 kilograms of silicon, single electron threshold, and 0 0.01 DRU backgrounds. Uh, this is a DOE BRN funded R&D experiment, which will merge the US efforts of Domic at Snow Lab, Domic M, and Sensei. And with that, I would just like to say thank you again for having me, and I look forward to our discussion in the coming days.